All right, we're going to have a brief discussion on the current literature surrounding sonographic assessment of the inferior vena cava, or IVC, during fluid resuscitation. So use of IVC ultrasonography during fluid resuscitation efforts has been a heavily debated topic in recent years, and its validity has recently been brought into question. The popularity of its use in emergency rooms and trauma centers in the U.S. has increased as it is a non-invasive, rapid, widely available, and highly trainable technique to guide therapy of critically ill patients. Appropriately, the number of clinical studies examining its validity has also grown. They come down on both sides of the issue, with some articles stating that fluid status can be directly correlated to the presence of IVC collapse in different populations of critically ill patients, while others state that it is primarily a reflection of central venous pressure, or CVP, which has been shown to be unreliable as a measure of volume status, particularly in septic patients. A recent meta-analysis in AGEM raised some concerns that the studies used to support the use of cable ultrasound are not adequately blinded and therefore not useful. This review will demonstrate that IVC ultrasound, or IVCU, can be a useful modality to guide resuscitation under the right circumstances with an understanding of its limitations. The argument has been made that there are too many variables for IVCU to be consistent as a measure of overall volume status since the size of the IVC varies widely between individuals and there are many comorbidities that can impair a patient's ability to clear venous blood from the circulation. For this reason, a non-collapsing IVC can falsely reassure a clinician to believe that a patient is adequately resuscitated. This line of reasoning misses critical points about IVCU. First, while static measurements of IVC diameter do vary widely from person to person, the relative change in IVC diameter that occurs during respiration, or respirophasic variability, predictably changes for an individual in a manner that correlates with acute changes in blood volume. The aforementioned meta-analysis that brought IVCU into question recently in AGEM 2012 failed to make this distinction. It cited studies that looked at the measurements of maximal IVC diameter, not the IVC collapsibility index. When IVC respirophasic variability is measured quantitatively as the IVC collapsibility, or cable index, it can be used to estimate the right atrial pressure and venous return accurately. This means that IVCU can be useful in two ways. By qualitative assessment of collapse yielding a dichotomous collapsing or not collapsing result, as well as a quantitative estimation of CVP. As for the argument that certain patient populations are inherently difficult to assess for fluid status, such as those with congestive heart failure and those with end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis, there is literature that demonstrates that it is still useful in fluid assessment during acute intravascular volume changes in those populations. Another problem with IVCU that leads to unreliable results is improper technique. Transducer placement and the site of IVC measurement are critical and must be done in a way that is consistent with the controlled trials done thus far. Measuring IVC collapse at the level of the diaphragm or use of M mode to calculate respirophasic variation have been shown to be inaccurate. Measurements taken at the level of the diaphragm where the IVC enters the right atrium are inconsistent with results at other sites and may underestimate the amount of collapse. Furthermore, Measurements at that site are highly susceptible to error secondary to motion of the diaphragm with expiration that causes caudal IVC displacement. Likewise, M mode can be affected by the same diaphragmatic motion, which makes it difficult to distinguish from IVC collapse when using the calipers to calculate the collapsibility index. In general, all IVC measurements must be at least 3 cm distal to the diaphragm to mitigate this effect. For the most consistent results, measurements must be taken 2 cm caudal to the hepatic vein inlet or just caudal to the left renal vein inlet. It is suggested that a low frequency probe, such as a phased array or curvilinear probe, be used for best tissue penetration. The optimal placement of the transducer and view of choice to acquire the IVC have not been well documented. Most of the studies to date have utilized the sub xiphoid long axis view as it takes advantage of the liver as a tissue window and can be found quickly and reliably in most patients. Many clinicians also use sub xiphoid short axis view as it is less prone to tangential slices that miss the maximal cross section of the IVC. When these approaches are not effective due to bowel gas, ascites, cirrhosis, etc., a mid axillary long axis view is also possible, taking care to not confuse the IVC with the abdominal aorta, which can be confirmed using color Doppler. The patient is considered fluid tolerant with a collapse of greater than 50% with inspiration. 
it must be noted that the effect of respiration on hypovolemic patients that are mechanically ventilated will be the opposite of those that are spontaneously breathing. Negative intrathoracic pressure during normal inspiration draws venous blood from the IVC into the thoracic cavity, causing collapse of the highly compliant vessel. Mechanical ventilation, on the other hand, relies on positive pressures to drive air into the lungs, which increases pressure on the IVC. In these patients, the IVC will distend with inspiration and return to baseline with expiration. Despite this reversal, respirophasic variation and IVC are still effective with standardized ventilation settings, as demonstrated by multiple studies since 2004. According to these studies, a positive result indicating that the patient is fluid responsive, or really that they are fluid tolerant, is an increase in diameter of 15 to 18 percent with inspiration. In patients with poor respiratory effort, the sniff test can be attempted in place of deep inspiration, but it has yet to be validated as an accurate technique. While multiple studies have demonstrated that IVCU is effective and reliable in assessing volume changes in an acute setting, there are limitations to the type of information that it provides. It is important to understand what aspects of a patient's physiology IVCU accurately reflects, as well as the information that it cannot provide to a clinician. This can be best summarized by use of the correct terminology. While clinicians often use IVCU in an effort to predict fluid responsiveness, it is more accurate to say that IVCU and the cable index reflect fluid tolerance. Visualizing a full IVC with less than 30% respirophasic variation does not indicate that the patient is adequately resuscitated. Equally, a collapsing IVC does not imply that giving more fluid will result in a positive clinical response. It is most useful to predict whether or not additional fluid will result in fluid overload and iatrogenic pulmonary edema. The decision to give a fluid bolus should be based on a patient's vital signs, physical appearance, and overall clinical picture. IVCU is a modality used as a supplement to clinical judgment to reassure the physician that additional fluid will not directly lead to an adverse outcome. There is an upper limit to the collapsibility index as well. Osman et al. in their 2007 study in critical care medicine found that its reliability diminishes after the patient has been volume depleted or septic for more than 12 hours. While this restricts the settings in which IVCU can be applied, it is still useful in the setting that emergency and trauma physicians are most likely to use. For an acute and critically ill patient that has clinical indications for rapid fluid administration and there is a concern for fluid overload. The most recent critical care studies available support this conclusion. IVCU should clearly not be the sole guide to fluid resuscitation procedures and there may be another reliable method of assessing volume status as a resuscitation guide. In the March 2014 issue of Critical Care, DC McKenzie and N.A. Khan proposed an alternative to the IVC ultrasound, carotid flow time. They studied a group of 68 donors that presented to their hospital's blood donation center and assessed carotid flow times corrected for heart rate using carotid Doppler ultrasound with a linear transducer before and after donating an average of 450 milliliters of blood. They measured peak velocity, systole time, and carotid flow time with the patient's supine before and after a 30-second passive leg raise, then had the patients give their donations and repeated the process. They found a significant difference in supine corrected flow times before and after donation, 320 milliseconds versus 296 milliseconds with a p-value of less than 0 0.0001, as well as a supine and passive leg raise following donation, 296 milliseconds versus 321 milliseconds. This preliminary study demonstrated that passive leg raise does not significantly alter carotid flow times in normal volemic patients, but is significantly decreased in volume depleted patients. This phenomenon has also been demonstrated in mechanically ventilated patients and supported in 2009 systematic review in critical care medicine. It is also possible to use passive leg raise with echocardiography to assess cardiac output before and after fluid loss, but this approach is likely impractical in most emergency room situations. While these are only preliminary studies, further research into carotid flow rate as a predictor of volume responsiveness is clearly warranted. It will need to be established as to whether or not there is an absolute and predictable range of carotid flow rates that can be used rapidly in comparison in emergent situations with critically ill patients. The bottom line of cable sonography is that there are times during volume resuscitation when it is useful and there are times when it is not. It is useful in both extremes of volume status and IVC findings, that is, fat and full versus flat and collapsing. That is to say, it is good at providing rapid qualitative distinction between relatively low, down at least 450 cc's, and high intravascular volume states. 
If a clinician is worried that giving another fluid bolus will result in iatrogenic pulmonary edema, seeing an IVC that is obviously collapsing greater than 50% should be reassuring. It may be less reliable in intermediately hypovolemic patients. Those that are hypovolemic by absolute intravascular volume changes less than 450 cc's, but are still adequately or moderately compensating. It is also only reliably useful in the acute phases of sepsis or shock. Ultimately, the body of literature over the last decade has shown that the use of ultrasound techniques involving the IVC does have merit in the right circumstances, but only alongside the physician's medical gestalt and the patient's overall picture must be taken into account. While other fluid status assessment methods may be further developed in the future and be incorporated into the sonographic analysis of the critical patient, the merits of IVC ultrasound will undoubtedly continue to be debated and investigated into the future. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have found this review useful and can incorporate it into your own clinical practice. For further resources on this topic, please see the references links that I've included at the end of this presentation.